white. It was the only color you saw around you, illuminating from the ceiling lights that casted around the dark corners. You were coughed onto the table by the prison guards, but you don't seem to know why you were there. All you know was that a visitor was coming by. You don't know who this visitor was until the door opens wide and a man in a black suit, carrying a briefcase, enters. They approach you, dropping their briefcase in front of you on the table. No guards were accompanying them, so it seemed privacy was warranted. You and this man conversed, a conversation spewed into an agreement that if you participated in this research program, you'd be offered a sentence reduction or a sum of cash. They handed you a legal waiver document, a non-disclosure agreement, and a few disclaimers that were worded in an unusual way. You hesitated at first, but signed it anyway and you were then shipped off to the middle of nowhere. Provided with a new prison uniform, a red jumpsuit with a strange triangle symbol, and an acronym that you were carrying around, CSD. This is but one of many scenarios for those who are recruited into the CSD program. Of course, many who are offered may simply reject the choice, but who would so blindly refuse such an offer where your prison sentence, let's say 20 years, would be reduced into 10 years? Better yet, how about that cash offer, 200,000 euro, or perhaps more? Uh, hi, uh, Future Pearson here, uh, doing the uh, editing for these voice lines. Uh, just to let you guys know that the authority doesn't just use the euro, they also use dollars, the Japanese yen, etc, etc. Any international currency they can get, uh, so yeah, they don't just rely on one currency. Thank you for understanding. Now, CSDs are not only limited to these two options, but they may also offer more depending on the behavior and participation within the program. We'll discuss more about the benefits of being a CSD, but let's explore what a CSD actually is. CSDs, confined subject disposables, disposables emphasized with a bracket, are the personnel within the authority that are recruited for purposes relating to experimentation. Specifically, reactions on how anomalies interact with human contact or behavior. They are the front lines, the test subjects that volunteer to do the things that a mere researcher would refuse to interact and irreparably get injured or worse. So the responsibility of who gets to interact with an RPC was outsourced to test subjects, hired through various backgrounds. Now, before we proceed, CSDs are not treated like guinea pigs. They are people like us, human beings who made a choice and are treated with the same respect and dignity through the fundamental basics of human rights. Now obviously, I don't necessarily think the authority in general is just training these CSDs because they care at their own heart. If anything, personnel have to follow through strict procedures and guidelines established by those within the ethics department. Presumably, due to the relations with an organization like the UNAAC, they have to maintain a reputation and not be seen as a cold, heartless slaughterhouse. You may notice the acronym for CSD is Confined Subject Disposable. Again, disposable is emphasized with a bracket. So, if we don't treat them like guinea pigs, are they disposable? The answer is no, obviously. They are not in any way expendable to a certain degree, but rather they are more considered as a necessary sacrifice to better understand human interaction with RPCs. On an important note on that, how CSDs interact with an RPC varies as the CSD themselves are divided into three categories, ranging from L1s to L3s. CSDs who have misdemeanor offenses are classified as L1 CSDs. Typically, L1s are the type of individuals who interact with RPCs that do not in any way cause any significant injury or psychological trauma. CSDs who are capable of causing harm or have committed an offense that resulted in the harming of another person, such as assault and battery, are classified as L2 CSDs. Those identified as L2 interact with RPCs that are in the risk of causing serious injury or, in worst case scenario, fatality. L2s approximately make up 80% total of CSDs within the authority. And lastly, CSDs have committed violent offenses such as terrorism, rape, murder, and such are classified as L3 CSDs. L3s are considered the worst due to the aforementioned offenses above, interacting with RPCs that may cause dismemberment, psychological trauma, or fatality. In basic terms, CSDs divided are based on their behavior and criminal history prior to their assignment in one of the three categories of CSD. I've briefly mentioned that CSDs get benefits or deals as part of the contribution to the CSD program. 
What specifically they may decide varies from person to person, but options include social welfare, financial support, better accommodation, prison transfer, and much more. On the topic of benefits, a CSD can request that any benefits that they are given can be conveyed to a family member or persons of their choice. This is an option in the event that they pass away during their tenure as a CSD or simply decided to do so at their own volition and help out issues with any relatives. However, there are a few limitations that a CSD may not actually get as part of their benefits. One example would be a pardon for all of their crimes and immediate release from prison. Now, it's not quite impossible for a CSD to actually request a pardon, but it's very unlikely to be granted by the authority. With how authority departments interact with each other on a daily basis, the process in acquiring CSD is handled by a few specific entities that partake in different aspects of the CSD process. The three main entities involved in these processes include the CND Dispositions, the Department of Expendable Candidate Fulfillment, and the Office of Ethics and Review. CND Dispositions is the primary component responsible for dispersing and acquiring CSDs. They're separated into four departments, Disposition, Upkeep, Acquisition, and Logistics. Disposition is responsible self-assurance and signing off the use of CSDs within the authority. Upkeep is responsible for maintaining accommodation and morale upkeep of CSDs. Acquisition is responsible for acquiring CSDs through various sources, from prisons, asylums, and sanatoriums. Logistics is responsible for transporting CSDs from one location to another, usually from a populated area to a site facility. Next is the Department of Expendable Candidate Fulfillment. Abbreviated as ECF, the department was once entrusted in the dispersal and acquisition of CSDs, but after recent events concerning budgetary constraints, that responsibility was transferred to CND dispositions. ECF currently is responsible for overseeing CND personnel to maintain efficacy in operations and quality. And finally, the Office of Ethics and Review. The Ethics Department, abbreviated as EAR or pronounced as EAR, is a primary office within the authority responsible for evaluating operations and investigating authority mandates, including ethical misconduct committed by staff. Ethics is often involved whenever a CSD is misused properly or abused, but the more important role they play in the CSD process is assigning its personnel to the CND disposition. Ethics personnel and liaisons who are assigned to the CND disposition are referred to as disposals and are the only people within the authority to authorize CSD usage. Whether you strongly disagree with the authority's use of CSDs or believing that scientific advances are hindered by ethical guidelines, CSDs play a vital part in better understanding the RPCs contained and researched. Whatever the case may be, CSDs chose to participate in the CSD program hoping to escape from their prison life, but what they won't escape is their guilt and regret for whatever it is that landed them in prison in the first place.